Hello, everyone. I think I'm supposed to start, and I just want to say um, thank you for coming. It is a pleasure to be here, and um, I enjoy being able to present some of my information about my book, Atomic Spy. Um, and actually, it, there are some overlaps a little bit with what's been talked about uh, this morning already. Um, Klaus Fuchs was a man of mystery and complexity. He was German by birth, British by naturalization, communist by conviction. Can everybody hear me? Great, okay. As a teenager in the late 1920s, his passion was mathematics, a young scholar who did not espouse uh, political opinions. By 1933, he had transformed into a 21-year-old firebrand whom the Nazi student leaders had come to hate and tried to kill. And by 1945, he had aided three countries in developing the atomic bomb, the United States, Britain, and Russia. Many accounts mythologize Fuchs as an isolated, reserved, lonely, frail person a characterization that has skewed our image of him. One trait is valid. He, he was a very reserved, always reserved person, but this is not what defined him. What defined Klaus Fuchs was his steely determination for social, political, and economic equality as he defined it. Fuchs lived in a chaotic time. It's probably safe to say that if he had lived in a different one, he would have had the life of an esteemed professor of mathematics at a renowned German university, a quiet, reserved, non-political scholar. Instead, in the 1950s, he became sufficiently infamous that even now someone asks me, was he really evil? How does one consider a person who risked his life to fight the Nazis and then spied against his adopted country? Maybe the real question is, how does one weigh the factors in determining moral accountability? Fuchs left behind little about himself. I located a half dozen overlooked archives that filled in gaps. Some files at the University of Kiel were simply labeled as miscellaneous disciplinary matters, noting nothing about Fuchs, and they'd probably been untouched for 85 years. There were hundreds of pages, and they laid bare his early drama. These documents and others, uh, probably 40, 50% of my book has never been um, revealed before, and there have been many uh, uh, biographies of Fuchs, but it's most of it's new, um, capture historically obscured moments in the 1930s and 40s. They give a more nuanced account of Fuchs's life as well as a new appreciation of an unraveling world. History takes us to a different but somewhat familiar place there. Swept into Fuchs's story are inter internal national struggles, conflicts over immigration and race, establishment of internment camps, dysfunctional legislatures, street protests, paramilitary troops, Russian spying, and nuclear weapons. I cover these subjects extensively in my book, Atomic Spy, and we'll touch on a few of them now. Keep in mind, this is not a spy story. It is the story of a spy. Now, here we go. Oops, I could do it this way. Worked. Okay. Um, Klaus Fuchs was born on December 29th, 1911, in the small town of Rüsselsheim, Germany, which is just south of Frankfurt. He was the third of four children, and his early years were formed by the devastation of World War I and its aftermath uh, the Allies' blockade and the resulting starvation, the Versailles Treaty. And here he is in his um, little army jacket with his brother, and you can see their trenches that they have built with little toy soldiers in them. And this was all during, you know, exorbitant inflation and then the Great Depression and unemployment. His father, Emil Fuchs, was a liberal minister in the very conservative Lutheran church. From early on, he championed the welfare of the working class. From the pulpit, 
letters and articles to the newspapers. He argued for its rights and condemned right-wing militia that were poisoning the country in the 1920s. He was a socialist, not a communist. His views and personality had a profound effect on Klaus and his siblings, who all became socialists. Klaus was opposite in temperament from his father. He was as reserved as Emma was outgoing, but they had the same unbending core. As a teenager, though, Klaus was the non-political scholar, famous for his mathematical gifts, and he won the Weimar Republic's um, prize for the best student in the this in his city. In 1933, he registered at the University of Leipzig to study mathematics. Oops, there's one picture. It, it's not. Sorry, there's this. Um, no, I want to go forwards. There, there's the family in, in um, Eisenach. So maybe I just have to put my hand over further or something. Okay, so he was at the, he, in 1930, he went to the Leib, uh, University of Leipzig to study mathematics. And in the early 1930s, the Weimar Republic um, was as unstable politically as it was economically. President Hindenburg ruled by executive decree because the legislature, the Reichstag, was stalemated. Frequent elections failed to create a ruling majority in the, in the Reichstag, largely because the socialists and the communists had a long-standing hatred for each other. Oops, sorry. Well, in the president election of 1932, the very conservative Hindenburg ran for a second term. I want to go backwards, backwards, backwards. There's the election. That's how they were electioneering at that point. The socialists, rather than nominating their own candidates, supported him. They didn't want to split the vote and allow another candidate to win, that other candidate being Adolf Hitler. This was a key turning point in Klaus's life. Every day for two years, he and his brother, older brother Gerhardt, had fought the policies of Hindenburg. It had started when Klaus came to the University of Leipzig, where Ger Gerhardt was already a law student. There he is in a skit, as well as an active member of the social student group, for which the skit is. And Klaus's first political act was to join this group. He was soon fighting Nazis in the streets and said that he learned more there than in the classroom. Now, his physics professor at that time was Werner Heisenberg. And um, he bored Fuchs because he taught the basics. Fuchs already know, knew the basics. He didn't teach quantum mechanics that he had just um, developed. So after first, uh, Klaus's first year in Leipzig, he and his brother transferred to the University of Kiel. In the late 1920s, the Nazis had gained a grip on the universities throughout Germany, and Kiel was no exception. Oops. Nope. Go back. Yeah, there's the group. Klaus and Gerhardt um, formed a leftist student group to counter the Nazis who had already had their own. And Gerhardt, who was an outspoken activist, just like his father, was the leader. Klaus was um, the political organizer, but he was really a novice. So he was underneath Gerhardt's wing and following his you know, direction. As was commonly the practice, they distributed provocative flyers as their attack weapon. So in Kiel in 1932, repulsed by Hindenburg's policies, Klaus and Gerhardt decided to support the communist candidate. It was the really only other option. The Socialist Party, where they were members, kicked them out. The Communist Party invited them in. They hesitated, but they finally joined and they never looked back. Meanwhile, the country fell apart with mobs in the streets and a shooting here and there, and finally riots with stormtroopers creating havoc. Hindenburg won the presidential election. 
Klaus's hatred for the Nazis increased and vice versa. A secret Nazi student council in Kiel sentenced him to death. In early February 1933, just after Hindenburg had appointed uh, Hitler as chancellor, which emboldened the Nazis, a riot erupted at the university. Stormtroopers rushed in and beat Klaus. The students, Nazi students who were there yelled, throw him in the fjord. Police stood by and watched. How Fuchs survived the frigid February inlet of the Baltic Sea is a mystery. All he ever said was he swam out. A few weeks later, Klaus traveled to Berlin and by coincidence, it was just hours after the Reichstag had burned. He knew immediately that he was in jeopardy and joined an underground network. Now, 20 year old students lasted about three months before the Gestapo grabbed them off the street and tortured them without mercy. By July of 1933, just a few months later, the Gestapo in Berlin were closing in on Klaus. Police in Kiel, where he was the number one wanted student, had alerted them. He fled to Paris and crossed the channel and ended up at the University of Bristol. He was 21 years old. His university years in Bristol gained him a BA and a PhD in physics under the future Nobelist Neville Mott. While there, he published an important article on the measurement of electrical conduction in thin film, a seminal work still widely referenced in microelectronics today. By 1937, he received a postdoctoral fellowship with another future noblest, Max Born, at the University of Edinburgh. Throughout, he was open about his communist ideology. Everyone knew he was. Although he did secretly contact German communist friends who had emigrated to London, and he worked with them to create propaganda against the Nazis and helped get it shipped from Scottish ports back to Germany. He was safe, but his family had fallen apart in Berlin. His brother Gerhard had escaped to Prague and had contracted a TB. His older sister Elizabeth had committed suicide as had their mother a few years before. His younger sister did obtain a visa to the US and went to college and was safe. But by 1939, only 67 year old father Emil was left in Berlin, and he was caring for his parentless grandson throughout the war. In September 1939, World War II began with the phony war. The real one began in September of 1940 with Dunkirk. At this moment, the British government worried that refugees who they knew were mostly Jews, would be a fifth column and aid the Germans if there was an invasion. So it ordered them all to be interned. And as one cabinet member said ignorantly, quote, once a German, always a German. So on Sunday, May 12th of 1940, Klaus became one of about 30,000 to be rounded up. Uh, these mostly men were herded into camps such as Heighton, which is where he was, surrounded by barbed wire and armed guards. There was little food, no newspapers or mail, and they were cramped in with Nazi POWs. Isolation, starvation, and fear. One internee described them all as, quote, caged animals. On July 3rd, the government shipped young male refugees, including Klaus, to Canada. As he was about to leave, he wrote a letter to his mentor, Max Born in Edinburgh, that said, quote, I find it hard to cut away from a country which I've learned to love. The 10-day trip across the Atlantic on the Etric to Quebec City was horrific. The internees lived through starvation and bouts of severe vomiting and diarrhea with no access to a bathroom during the night. No one escaped the stench, filth, and squalor. Arriving in Quebec, the refugees stood on deck in searing sun for 10 hours with little water and no food. 
And finally, at 7 p.m., they were bussed up to the Plains of Abraham and Camp L. More barbed wire and armed guards. In Camp L, they did get good food, but it was offset by hours and hours of boredom. Oops. Okay. Um, these included, um, oh, I'm sorry, missed a picture, but, and as the camp commander explained, quote, some of the brainiest people in Canada are in this camp. These included such notables as future Nobel Prize winner Max Perutz and developers of the steady state theory of the universe, Herman Bondi and Tommy Gold. So to break up this boredom, they set up an impressive university given almost all in German and a grateful Perutz always thanked folks for having learned physics from him. Other time was spent on camp politics and there were cliques that formed. The leader of the communists, was the charismatic yeah. Hans Kahler, who had been a friend of Hemingway's during the Spanish Civil War, which is here walking down a dusty road. Uh, folks became his deputy in the camp. Basically, I think recreating his earlier relationship, which was very close with his brother Gerhardt. Kala and Fuchs skillfully, skillfully organized a broad refugee committee when the Canadian government decided to split up Camp L to create a kosher one for Orthodox Jews. Uh, that's, that is Camp L. And that is Camp N. They put them here um, and but there was a big discussion about who got to go there. And Klaus was able to manipulate the numbers so that non-Jewish communists were there too. This particular group feared the assured brutality of the alternative camp, which was filled with Nazi POWs. The communists didn't have a chance there. In January of 1941, Fuchs was released from internment and returned to Edinburgh. He received an offer from another German refugee named Rudy Piles to work on the nascent atomic bomb project at the University of Birmingham, specifically on gaseous diffusion, which is a technique to separate the fissile uranium isotope U-235 from that of U-238. Once there in Birmingham, Fuchs began socializing with other communists who were there from the camp, including Hans Kahler, who was in reality a recruiter for Russian military intelligence. So not surprisingly, with that allegiance, in August of 1941, Fuchs met up with a Russian agent in London, taking the step into espionage that sealed his fate. Internment alone did not create Klaus Fuchs the spy. It did reawaken Klaus Fuchs the communist and the resistor, giving him that in road. In September of 1943, Fuchs sailed to New York City. Oh, these have gotten messed up. I'm sorry. Um, with the British scientific team to work in the Manhattan Project. The design of the US gaseous diffusion plant in the US, the one that ended up at Oak Ridge, um, had problems with the pressure and flow controls. As Fuchs wrote, I developed the theory of the control system for the US diffusion plant, which was further amplified by the research group at Kellex and applied to its operation. At the same time, he fleetingly met throughout the city his new agent for the Russians and gave him as much top secret information as he could. Then came his transfer to Los Alamos, and I'm going to play around with these pictures for a minute. Uh, he comes up in just a minute. Uh, don't know if I can come back to him. There's New York in the Woolworth building. There's Los Alamos, where under, and Rudy Piles was there, his friend from Birmingham, and he worked with him and a future Nobelist, 
Hans Bethe, Fuchs was responsible for their theoretical work on the lenses for the plutonium bomb. This work was one of the keys to the bomb's success. There were many keys, but this one had to be there. Fuchs wrote, quote, I developed the theory of the jets observed observed in non-lens implosions, the elimination of which, which is necessary to make this type of implosion workable. On June 2nd of 1941, Fuchs drove to the gate at Los Alamos. Let's see what we get here. Yeah. And the guards searched his car. He then drove to the outskirts of Santa Fe to meet his handler from New York and gave him the plans for the plutonium bomb. During the car search, these plans had been in Fuchs's jacket pocket. A month later, the Trinity test at Alamogordo for the plutonium bomb was a success. Then came Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, US and UK scientists foresaw an arms race. To thwart it, they urged their governments to share the information on the atomic bomb with the Russians and institute a strict inspection regimen, and the UK and the US said no. Fuchs returned to England in the summer of 1946 and became head of the theoretical research uh, project at the top new top secret nuclear facility at Harwell, which is near Oxford. Um, the 15 theoretical physicists in Fuchs's division supported the creation of nuclear reactors that Britain envisioned for its commercial future. At another top secret site, a team of scientists worked on developing Britain's atomic bomb. Fuchs was the main theoretical consultant to that project. Initially, he didn't spy in England. Uh, the arrests of Russian spies in Canada, the US, and Britain had created a very unfavorable atmosphere. But by 1947, he felt safe again, and he made contact with a new Russian agent, Alexander Feklasov, whose picture showed briefly a minute ago. I won't try to find it. And then another life-changing event occurred. In August of 1949, US and UK codebreakers in Arlington, Virginia, deciphered some early 1940s Russian messages. It was a project later called Venona. And in Arlington, Virginia, just close to where I am, um, they found that th these messages contained evidence of a spy in the Manhattan Project. Clues very quickly led MI5 and FBI to Klaus. You see, here's what one of the messages looked like when they de deciphered them. Without these messages, it was highly unlikely that Klaus would have ever been discovered. A game of cat and mouse ensued between Fuchs and MI5. It began with MI following his every move, the phone call, conversation, his office in his house, everything was bugged. They needed to catch him turning over material because Venona was top secret and, they, and to keep the Russians ignorant of it, they couldn't use it in court. Um, but Fuchs had stopped spying months earlier. Why he stopped is a mystery. Before MI5 and the FBI had an inkling of, of any spy, Fuchs knew that he might be found out. How is not clear. When MI5 began tailing him around England in September of 1949, he quickly spotted them. He was on the lookout for him. So he became the cat, not the mouse. When the surveillance failed, as it was bound to do, MI5 sent its top interviewer, Jim Scarden. He couldn't trip folks up, and he didn't get a confession. But at the end of January 1950, Fuchs confessed on his own volition. He struggled with having betrayed his friends and perhaps subjecting them to the suspicion if he didn't confess because somebody was a spy. A month later, on March 1st, he pled guilty in a trial on the Ill Bailey that lasted 88 minutes and was a media sensation. The judge gave him the max, 14 years for espionage. Fuchs was shocked. He had been told that since he cooperated, his sentence would be light, but he didn't appeal, even though he had some grounds because there were some irregularities in the interview process. He knew he was guilty and he felt he should just accept the punishment. For the Americans and the British, there was a somber backdrop to this hunt that they'd gone through. 
Also in August of 1949, the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, discovered that the Russians had successfully tested a plutonium bomb. Fuchs's information had moved up their timetable one to two years. No scientists in the U.S. and the U.K. ever doubted uh, the Russians' scientists' ability to build a bomb. They just thought it would be later. While in prison, Fuchs continued to answer questions for MI5 and the FBI, especially about his, the Russian agents who worked with him. Although by the time he remembered important details, the person in question had already left Britain, so nobody was ever arrested directly from his information. Two people he didn't give up were his last handler in Britain, Alexander Feklasov, and his American contact, Harry Gold. He did give a vague, somewhat um, misleading description of Gold to the FBI, which was under tremendous pressure from uh, the director, J. Edgar Hoover, to find the go-between. And eventually, the FBI did find Gold. Behind closed doors, Congress was pressing Hoover with an important question. Why didn't the FBI detect the spying? Hoover blamed MI5 with reason. Since 1934, MI5's security file on Fuchs had contained information on his communist ties in Germany. With every single security clearance, questions arose, but MI5 dismissed the possibility of his spying, and they didn't share this information with the Americans. Instead, they assured the FBI they had done rigorous security clearances on all scientists on the British team. However, at the same time, uh, MI5 told a senior British government official who was responding to the U.S. not to reveal Fuchs's communist background to the Americans. Starting in March of 1950, Fuchs served his time in several Victorian prisons and uh, was always held in high esteem either by, by the other inmates. He listened to their problems, he gave them cigarettes, and he began courses in mathematics, physics, and other sciences for them. Some inmates later thanked him. Uh, the courses helped them to get jobs when they got out, and Fuchs was paroled in nine years for good behavior. The British tried to persuade him to stay and work with them. They still wanted his talents, even though all what had happened. But on June 23rd of 1959, he climbed aboard a Polish airliner in London Airport, now Heathrow. He landed in East Berlin to no hero's welcome. His nephew, Klaus, whom Emil had raised, the little boy, met him along with a government official. Of course, there were hordes of journalists as there had been in um, London. And, but uh, a limousine uh, whisked them away. It was driven by a Stasi agent, with which they didn't know, they learned later. And he took them to Emil's summer cottage. By September, Klaus was the deputy director of the nuclear research facility in Dresden, had a nice apartment in the city and a weekend home nearby, and had, met a, had married Greta Carlson, who was the same um, government official who had greeted him at the airport in East Berlin. They had met in there we go. They had met in Paris in 1933. The Russians wanted him to work on weapons research at Dubna, which was their nuclear facility, and he refused. His dream that had begun at Harwell was to develop breeder reactors. He wanted them to power the East German economy, as opposed to the terrible uh, coal and things they had. The East German government made him promises to this effect, and then they abandoned him and his research, and he was devastated. I don't think he ever got over it. In later years, the man who had been key in creating bombs for three countries called for nuclear disarmament. Perhaps he had always been a peacenik, after all, his father became a Quaker while a Lutheran minister. Klaus's short-term short goals had been to help create a bomb ahead of the Nazis. That was number one. But then he wanted to protect the Russians from, quote, 
capitalist and imperialist nuclear blackmail. He maintained he wanted to create a nuclear balance and obviate the bomb's further use. He died in January of 1988 at age 76 of lung cancer. He was buried in the Berlin Cemetery for noted communists and had a very formal funeral with processions and a string quartet. While he was alive, the Russians never acknowledged his help. On this occasion, they did somewhat. They sent a large wreath along with a government representative. And as a young KGB agent from Dresden, whom we've already mentioned, named Vladimir Putin. He was at Klaus's funeral representing the Soviets. What about the significance of Fuchs's spying for military purposes? The Russians' advance in schedule meant that they had a bomb um, when the Korean War started. There were many factors involved in President Truman's decision not to drop the bomb which most people consider a benefit. And the Russians having won certainly played a part. How big a part is still debated. The political downside though is indisputable. Anglo-American nuclear cooperation ceased after folks. American citizens succumbed to the Red Scare hysteria whipped up by Senator Joseph McCarthy. American civil liberties suffered and the Cold War heated up. Fuchs, the quiet, serious student of mathematics, faced perils, took life-threatening risks, and made grave choices. So how do we judge him? The question of moral accountability isn't new, and it is still with us, and as confusing and divisive as to resolve. Now we, in the US, debate the standing of our most notable founders. In our own chaotic world, ambiguity prevails. One more. There we go. Um, if a deeper understanding of these issues may still, uh, which are still here with us, um, is still interest you, please read Atomic Spy. It's now in hardcover and and paperback and tell your friends and also go to my website atomicspythebook.com there are four interesting videos on there um, that uh, are just little snippets from different times of the the story so i thank you Yes. Oh, this is a, okay. I'll put it really close. That was fascinating. Thank you. Uh, what drove you to this? I know perhaps there's a, the, a logical Max Born succession because you, that was the first book you did. But why did you do a book on Max Born? Oh, that's actually interesting. Um, Max Born's granddaughter is it put it back okay is olivia newton john now max born is a now you've got everybody's attention <laughs> um he was a german brilliant physicist um and came left germany because he was jewish in 1933 the whole and went to england and ended up in edinburgh olivia newton john is a friend of mine and I was at her house in Malibu, sitting, looking at the gorgeous Pacific Ocean, talking to her mother who had just come over from Australia. And she said to me, she was telling me, I mean, she knew, she had known Einstein as a kid. Max Born knew everybody. Um, every, he had 12 different Nobel physicists who had become, were his students, as well as people like Robert Oppenheimer got his PhD from him and Teller uh, was, Edward Teller was his student as a fellow as well. And, and Irena, her mom, said to me, so she's telling me all these stories of her life in Germany, and we were just meeting, and she said, nobody has ever written my father's biography, and I don't know why, and 
I didn't think much about it. And I was flying home and I, and I was thinking about writing a biography, um, a different biography, also of a German for some reason named Bruno Bettelheim, because I had known him and closely actually, and he had died. And I thought he was a child psychologist and I thought, and my husband had been a child psychiatrist. So there was a tie in there. And so, but Bruno had some issues with other people. And I just wasn't sure I wanted to go into his biography, but it was in the back of my mind because I always wanted to do one. And when I, what struck me when I was on the plane um, was, or Irena's words, and I said to myself, gee, I could do that, write a biography of Max Born. Now, I knew no physics, no German, no German history, you know, I didn't know anything. And I just decided, well, I'll call them, I'll call up Olivia and Irena and ask them if I can do it. And they said, sure. And that was it. And I didn't know I had to um, get permission from Irena's brother who lived in London, he was in charge of all the papers and he and I, there was no reason for him to ever give me permission. I mean, I knew nothing. And we had lunch together and he said, sure. Off I was to the University of Edinburgh where all the papers were. So that's how it, that's, and then Fuchs being there, um, it was very interesting. I was, I found him interesting when I was writing about Max and I wanted to put in more about him about the, in, in that book. And, um, I went to the National Archives, which are, they're British and they're in Kew near where the garden is. And I, I couldn't find, I found a couple of little thin folders. And this was in like 2000, it was you know 20 years ago. Uh, nothing was there. And then as I'm going through this one file, it says uh, there were a hundred chapter, a uh, hundred files. And they had, um, someone had told them to, to throw them all away. So I just decided there wasn't any information on Klaus Works because they'd all been thrown away. All of the trial work and all everything had been thrown away. Um, but when I went back 10 years later, it turned out that MI5 during that time had uh, declassified huge numbers of documents and Fuchs's files were one of them. And there were about 20 files as well as the whole bunch and all the people he was related to and everything else was going on. So it turned out, um, and then I found other, I found huge amounts of material in, as I mentioned, in the University of Kiel, uh, this miscellaneous file, you know, on disciplinary matters, the whole thing was about the Fuchses and the Nazis. There wasn't anybody else in there. And it was hundreds of pages about what was going on between them. And there's a lot more of that in the book. But um, so I, I had so much material. It, it was very difficult then to write the book and try to figure out what was important. So that's how I did it. So what did Max Born at some point, he, he was alive when uh, the Fuchs exposure as a spy. He knew he was a communist. Everybody knew he was a communist. Right. He was a communist. Of the, but nobody knew him for at the time, certainly spy. And then all of a sudden, all this comes up. Uh, it's a media sensation, including the trial in 1950. Do you get a sense of Max Born's reaction? Yes. Um, his wife kept a diary, and he wrote a lot of letters, and he kept them all. Germans are very good about archiving everything they do and write lots of memoirs. Um, so he, they were shocked. They had no idea that Fuchs, uh, he was this very nice man who used to come and play scat with them. It's a three-handed card game. He was a member of the Bourne's um, little trio or quartet that Bourne was a very fine pianist. And so he would have other musicians come over and the folks play the violin, self-taught, not very good, but he, he would come over, he would have dinner with them and, and very, very obliging and always helpful for everybody. So they, they were just couldn't believe it. And many of his friends did not believe it. They felt that he was being falsely accused and tried to help him out and make sure he hadn't had a nervous breakdown and was just you know, so the, the, when Fuchs, uh, when Bourne was um, interviewed by the newspapers, he just, he said, truthfully, he knew nothing about that, but he, and he never even went into, he just kept basically silent, except saying he didn't know anything about it. He didn't say he knew him. Fuchs was a communist. He just didn't want to get involved. The emigres were 
really, in, in 1949, 1950, there was still a lot of pressure about them. There news because there were a lot of spies that were being turned over at that particular time. And so there, there was a time when Rudy Piles and Max Bourne and a couple of other people had their pictures in the front page. And they looked like a rogues gallery saying, you know, these their passports have been taken away from them, which was not true. But so there were a lot of stories going around. It was a fearful time for these refugees, even though they'd been there for 15, 20 years and were citizens and helped in the war effort and had done all this research. So he just, he kept his mouth shut, but he was always very disappointed and he, um, he kind of understood it, but he didn't approve. Do you understand it? Now that you've written a book on Klaus Fuchs and clearly he's a spy of significance having taken uh, plans which he uh, obtained through at Los Alamos, and cut it, not cut a deal, he, he transferred him. I, I don't get a sense he, he got financially rewarded for this. No, he got no money. He once took a hundred pounds because he felt it would show his commitment, but he never took any money so from them at all. It, was, it, it was all ideology. And it, it, it his father was very rigid. He, he, um, and, the, and the children were somewhat black and white in their thinking even though they could, he, I mean, obviously Klaus could be as abstract as he needed to be with mathematics and physics, but when it came to political things, he had a sense of what was right. And what was right was for the working class to have equality. And he was willing to do what was necessary for that to happen. His father wanted to do it through socialism, much like what you know Sweden has, that kind of socialism, and where you would get there through a democratic process. Communism basically had the same goal, and I mean, in a general sense, but they wanted to do it through revolution. And in the 30s, when he was a student, Klaus decided it was the only way to get there because the socialists in, in Germany had already kind of gone along with the right wing, not the Nazis, but you know, Hindenburg and his policies. So when Klaus became a communist, that was the way it had to be done, and he knew. There was a lot of talk in the early 30s in the newspaper about um, the Germans going up against the Russians. There was a lot of fear of communism in England. And the sense was that, and especially in the upper class, who were the ones, the people who um, were in charge for the most part, that if there should be a war between these two, and hopefully Germany would win. They were so afraid, afraid of Bolshevism. So when he saw that, he just decided he had to help. And he had to make sure that the working class main, you know, was, was, had a fair chance. And that's what he did. And that was his sense of right. Well, the working class uh, also played at another level where he's in Los Alamos working for a British United States consortium of uh, uh, revealing, which ultimately led to the, the bomb. And uh, at what point do you get a sense that he had a sense that, all right, he's got the secrets that in fact now in order to kind of level the playing field, I better share those. Get a, get a, was there an aha moment? He had already, he had started his spying in Birmingham because of being recruited, I believe, by Hans Koller, this military intelligence person. I don't think if, I think if he hadn't been interned, he never would have spied. Maybe not. His nephew, little Klaus, who became very big as he grew up, uh, he and I debated that, and he wasn't so sure I was right. But there, it wasn't in his background. It wasn't in Klaus's background to do that. So he, he only was turning over information when he was in Birmingham that he himself had created, and he felt he had a right to do that. When he went to the, to the U.S., and it, I don't know why, he decided to give everything he got his hands on, and that was exactly the trajectory he followed when he was in uh, Los Alamos, and he had access. They had little color-carded color-coded cards of who could get into which buildings and which libraries, you know, depending on your security uh, level. And he had the highest security because of the work he was doing. He could sit in their library and he basically wrote down all of the um, very specific numbers for the plutonium bomb. He could have recreated much of it just out of his head because he 
was able to do that. But the exact measurements he had to write down and he sat there in the library and wrote that, that was what was in his jacket pocket that he gave to the Russian um, handler, Harry Gold. So, so it, he was just following through and he continued to do the same thing um, when he got to England, he, you know, later on, but he also spied for the British. They, before they knew he was a spy, they, he was a couple of times, folks came over during the late forties to work on other things with the, with the Americans. And they asked him to get as much information as he could about the hydrogen bomb because the Americans were no longer giving information. So he brought all that back to the British so that they had information. So he was spying for them <laughs> and he also gave it to the Russians that, you know, he, he spread it around. Curious, uh, the actual messages that he was delivering, were they coded at all or was it just kind of direct verbatim, his notes so that the Russians could look at it without having to go through some cipher to get to the- They notes? were just, they were his notes. Just his notes. So yeah. that's the raw material. So yeah. if he had been caught, dead meat. Exactly, yes. Uh, Ultimately, and I found interesting, and this is a little known Nuremberg fact, uh, that when he was confessed and put on trial uh, essentially to determine the sentence, right. the uh, chief prosecutor for the British, do you, do you, do you, it's in their book, but do you remember his name? The chief British prosecutor? You know, this is terrible. I mean, I would have two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not asking you to video. But I caught it immediately because it was Shawcross. Sir Hartley Shawcross. Shawcross. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Sir Hartley yeah. Shawcross for us Nuremberg trial oh, folks really? was the chief British prosecutor at the Nuremberg trial. So we have Robert Jackson, our guy, chief American prosecutor at the Nuremberg trial. Sir Hartley Shawcross, chief British prosecutor at the Nuremberg trial. And now we find him as the chief prosecutor of Klaus Fuchs. Well, isn't that an interesting coincidence? Yeah, it's a beautiful <laughs> thing. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, he, is, he is sentenced and then uh, serves his time. And then at his request, he chooses to take a Polish airline to East Germany. Well, he had to take it. It was a big problem of how to get him out of there because the Germans didn't have the right to have planes in in London. Uh -huh. So it was there was there was discussion whether he could take a boat. Um, so it was it had to be a neutral country who was willing to who, who could land in Germany, and that's how it happened. So it comes to, goes back to East Germany, a place where we're going to learn more about soon from uh, Council General Gill. Uh, what was the reception in East Germany? You, I saw him get off. There wasn't necessarily a hero's welcome. It's more of a uh, media curiosity. And the media, for the most part, was kept away. They were not allowed to be close. All of the West German journalists had to couldn't go into East Germany. They didn't have permission. So they were behind a fence. And then there were the East Germans, but the East Germans did not want a lot of information about Klaus. He was never in the newspaper. He was not welcomed as the person who gave the information about the bomb. When he was working in the nuclear facility, his, his colleagues did not talk to him about it. It was just not mentioned and, and it was not shared. It was a secret that he had been a spy. So there were some press there and there was an American who did, um, there were a couple of cars that followed the limousine out and there was one American reporter who continued the, the, the chase, who actually was able to get, the, the, the car had to stop at a railroad crossing. And uh, this journalist jumped out and asked Klaus if he could interview him and Klaus said yes, come to my father's cottage tomorrow. And this person came a couple of times and, and did interview him. He was the only person um, who did. And fortunately he wrote a book about it, which no one else had ever looked at. <laughs> so I, I mean, that was another piece that I found out the, 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 whole, um, the whole story behind this journalist getting this story, big scoop. And of course it didn't go into the East German uh, newspapers. It only went into the West, but occasionally people would, you know, have see some of those and bring it over and stuff. You get a sense he was discouraged. I mean, here he was, he did stuff ideologically for 
the communists belief ideologically for the benefit of his motherland, which was Germany and this now uh, East Germany. Uh, and yet he's, it's, I got the sense from reading your book that he was sort of not received and welcomed and his ideas maybe were deemed outdated. And there was just not a hero's or not, not a response that I suspect he expected. I, I don't know what he expected. He, I think his biggest uh, disappointment was not being able to do the research he wanted to do. He was a pure researcher and that's what he thought about all the time. And I don't think from a, an, an ego point of view, he didn't need to be thanked and lavished you know, praise on or anything like that. He, didn't, he was a quiet, reserved person. He would have um, shrunk away. But the, the, the science was extremely important to him. And he felt that it was a dagger. I mean, he'd wanted to do this. He he sat in um, this prison for nine years thinking about this stuff. And one of the things he did say once in the interview was that he had no idea that the East that the East Germany would not be interested in reactors. That he and he the, he the way he said it was a little bit like, well, gee, if I'd realized that they wouldn't have done that. Maybe I would have stayed in, he didn't say this, but I would have stayed in England because he knew there he could have worked on it. And, and I, he, 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 his um, niece went, who's American, went to the University of Leipzig and used to visit with him all the time. And I tried to get a sense from her of, you know, his integration into the society and his happiness there or whatever. He, he seemed to be very happy with Greta. They did well together, but he, I don't think he was a particularly happy person. He, he saw the limitations. He did not believe in the Stalinist type of communism or the East German type of communism. He, he saw a pure form of communism that would help the, the working class is what he wanted. And he did not see that as evidence in either of those systems. And consequently, he, but he was never, per he never complained about anything for the most part. And he just lived his life. Is there any sense of remorse that he had? I mean, clearly he did something which expedited, something that probably was gonna occur anyways. Certainly the uh, e equality of arms on both sides, but he was the guy, he was the causal effect for that uh, expediting the process. Did he have any reflections on that? Any, any he, he did not have a problem ever, as far as I could see, with the actual act of spying. Where he had a problem was that he felt he had left his, let his friends down. And he felt that his whole life. And he tried to make amends for that, just as, as a person in having done that. He felt that was a grievous sin on his part, that he had not identified that earlier, that problem, and the fact that it could even occur earlier on, he was just so focused on doing what he wanted to do. So um, he, that's what he felt sorry about, and he wrote about later on, but not about the spying. You're the biographer of Klaus Fuchs. Uh, if he were sitting here, and the roles were reversed, and you had a, a question or two of him that uh, you would ask, what would that be? Well, there were a lot of gaps in, in actually what happened with the uh, MI5 and all. So, it, and I don't know if MI5 has that information or not because you only have what they give out, and they do keep things back. And um, there, there was one big hole in this in the um, when they were chasing him, and they finally got him. And were well before when they they knew they had him, but they couldn't get him because they couldn't get him to confess. And so they had the first interview with him, and he showed no signs. They couldn't figure out if he was guilty or not. They had a neutral attitude. In fact, some of them thought maybe he wasn't guilty after this. After that two or three hour interview, he went home, and there were. Um, microphones and things in his house, but they were closed. They were cut off for various reasons at midnight. And there's some, somebody knocked on his door after midnight and he did not answer it. And he had a lady friend who called him for an hour and a half at two o'clock in the morning, trying to get him to see what had happened. And he did not answer. And 
it's not clear that he would that he was in his his house, but if he if he were not there, where he went? Did he just drive around? Was there somebody he went to tell to let them know what had happened to him? I think there was. I'm not sure who. I have some idea of who it might have been. A woman named Sonia. There's been a book about her recently <laughs> by Ben McIntyre, um, just last year, I think. And he was. She was one of his handlers. And I think he, and she lived close by, and I think he had some way of getting in touch with her to let them know what had happened to him and that he had not confessed. But I would love to know what he did. And MI5 did not make any, the next day, they always had a report every day. They noted that all these things happened and they never asked any questions about it. So <laughs> why they, I mean, they asked questions about everything else. That one just stumped me completely and there's no information. Well, I highly recommend this book. Um, and as I concluded it uh, a couple of days ago, if you had to crawl into my brain, what is it down? What would you want me to have downloaded as a result of having read the book? What's the walk away that you would hope that I would have gotten? Well, the, the theme I had in the book, which I talked about, was... Um, moral accountability and how we judge people. And I think everybody has their own standards. And sometimes people do one thing wrong and it may be not a good thing either, but maybe not the worst thing in the world. And that stains them forever. And that is who they are. And everything else they've ever done doesn't count. And I think people should think about that by judging people and giving people a chance of um, really looking that we all have these <laughs> sides of ourselves. We all do some things. We've lied about something or we've done something, you know, whatever we've done. We've all done it. And we all know that we also are good people and try to do the right thing as well. Some people do it in a more extreme way, as Fuchs did. He risked his life for the Nazis. There's no doubt about that. And we have to sit here and say to ourselves, would we have done that? I don't know if I would have at a 20 year old, uh, knowing what they were doing to people at that time. And then he betrayed that country, which to me is was not his, his adopted country, not the right thing to do. So it's how do you put these pieces together in thinking about people? And it's very important because we're looking, we look at you know, all kinds of uh, po political situations and foreigners and, you know, how we judge people. And it's, there's a certain amount of tolerance, I think, that needs to be um, maintained. But also there are some things that need to be a line drawn at. So that's what I would hope that people would think about, at least if they even, they can't come to any strong conclusions. To me, it's a worthwhile path to explore when you are having those questions in front of you. Speaking of questions, is there one that you were couldn't wait for me to ask that I haven't yet? <laughs> well, you know, if I could just um, probably, but there was a little anecdote I want to tell you that um, has to do with what Art was talking about, because Alexander Feklazov was his Fuchs's last handler, and he was never give Fuchs never gave him up, and so in the early '60s he ended up in Washington at the embassy, the Russian embassy. And he was a friend of John Scalley's, who was a newspaper person, because he did, prop, uh, Fekulsov did propaganda and stuff for the, and he, he was, a, I think, a friendly, gregarious guy. And he and John Scalley had lunch together um, one day during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Fekulsov gave Scalley an impression of how the Russians would react in a certain way if we invaded or what they were going to do or all their, you know, it wasn't anything he had received from the Russians. It was his own thoughts because he, I think he didn't want a war. And so he told all of this to Scali and Scali went, it was friends with, I think with the secretary of state was Dean Rusk at that point maybe. And he went and told Rusk, Rusk told Kennedy and um, Feklazov ended up because of that of being a back channel of helping them mm -hmm. do some of the negotiations. Some people think that he um, in that he definitely did that. There's no doubt how much of an influence he had people debate. When you read his memoir, he 
had a considerable, I mean, he was one more voice of reason, if nothing else. Um, but it's, if, if folks had given him up, he wouldn't have been sitting there helping out. So it's, it's, it's interesting how history can come back in a very funny loop because certainly the Brits wanted him, but they may have gotten more from him by not having him given up. And she's not giving up all the information that there is in this book, and I highly recommend it. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nancy Thorndike Greenspan. Thank you.